yet again. Um, I, I think I saw many of you at Mark's talk on Monday of this week. Um, and don't forget we'll have an open house and a book signing uh, for Mark at the Maywa today. David, 5.30 to 7.30, right? 5.30 Yeah, 5.30 to 7.30. Yeah, so, so open, open house, stop by, uh, pick up a copy of Mark's book. He has a, a special Butte handshake price on those. Um, seriously, it's a, it's a good discount, uh, great book, don't miss it, uh, about the Chinese in Montana. So hope to see many of you back at 5.30 today. Um, so my talk today is In the Mood for Love, based on a uh, famous Chinese movie that featured this style of dress. And in particular, it, the tie to Butte is through Margaret Wu, who married into the Qin family uh, here in Butte, um, right at the end of World War II. But she lived in China and had 27 of these dresses tailor-made for her, 1935 to 1937. So whoever thought that I would become a fashion historian? <laughs> So brief overview, I'll tell you a little how I got interested in this topic. I'll set up some historical context about how this style of dress emerged in Chinese culture. Then talk a bit about Margaret Wu, her time in the 1930s in China, and this chapao, we say in Mandarin Chinese, although Margaret Wu was from a Cantonese family, a Pearl River Delta family. So she would have called this dress Qian Sang. Even today, Cantonese is a remarkably distinct language. It's not even really a dialect, as I think Mark would argue, who uh, did a lot of translations for his book. It's really fundamentally a, a separate language. Uh, so the Chapao style, or Qian Sang, style dress, and then a little bit about the mythical status that this style of dress became and how the dress became almost like an actor or a character in both American and Chinese films. And then wrapping up with a little bit about the Chapao dress today. So I became interested in Chinese history and culture in the late 1980s when I was in grad school at Cornell and formed a very close friendship with a Chinese guy. We became like brothers, stayed in contact. He made me promise to come back and teach in China, which I finally did in 2012 and have been back three times since then uh, to teach at various Chinese universities. And so as I became increasingly interested in Chinese history, the natural fit here in Butte, of course, was to become involved with the Meiwa Society. Um, I'm a past president of the Meiwa. Our current president, uh, David Stonehawker, is here today. Uh, one of our board members, uh, uh, Mark, that will be doing um, our, our book reception later today, uh, is in the back. Um, a former uh, docent, uh, Tom, is, is here. And also Hal Waldrop, who is one of the instrumental figures in preserving the amazing collection of stuff. Family stuff, mercantile store stuff. Oh, and, and oh, I'm sorry, Mary. And, and I missed Mary McCormick also, um, a board member. Um, and my wife, Jan, who is currently um, helping get our gift shop um, in, 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 in good repair. Yeah. Um, so thank you for all your support there. The Mingma tells the social history of a Chinese American family on the western frontier. So the Chins raised their nine kids in this house and, and business. They ran um, a, a mercantile here on the ground floor of the Wachang Tai, and then initially in 1899, a small noodle parlor restaurant on the upper floor 
which then expanded into a much larger restaurant after they built the Mewa building as an add-on in 1909. Um, intermediate sort of floor gave, we call it the cheater story. The Mewa didn't, uh, the Chin family didn't have to pay taxes on that square footage. It gave them additional living space on the Mewa side, and it gave them some small shop areas to rent out on the Wachung Thai side. So when we think of the Mewa as a museum, it's really a house museum. And it revolves around this Chin family. We have thousands of really precious, rare artifacts, ranging from the 19th century uh, Happy Buddha statue to a Guan Yu or a Buddhist religious statue that was in the original Joss House or Buddhist Worship Center here in Butte. So Margaret Wu, uh, then. So Margaret Wu is a Chinese American daughter. She's born in China in 1912, moves to America in 1914 to join her already established family, father, in Minneapolis. She's the daughter of a middle-class merchant family, much like the Chins here in Butte. They ran a, a very elegant restaurant in Minneapolis. But a little bit unlike the Chins, who came to be very dedicated to living permanently in America, the Wu family was split on that. And they were a very transnational family, always kept one foot back in China. They had built a house there that Margaret Wu's parents were going to retire to in 1935. Her father, unfortunately, died before that could happen, but Margaret went back to the house in the village that uh, the family had built with her mother and two brothers, and she absolutely hated it. She couldn't stand living in this remote, isolated, what she considered very backward, very traditional village setting in China. So she said, Mom, I can't take it here. Mom says, I want to marry you off to a local village boy. She says in her diary, I'm not having none of that. <laughs> she goes off to college in the nearby city of Canton, nowadays called Guangzhou, and enrolls in Lingnan College, a um, very international college, um, still exists as part of Sun Yat-sen University um, in Guangzhou. She studied at the college there in 1936-1937, left just ahead of the Japanese um, invasion, and returns to America with 27 of the dresses like you see displayed here. Eventually then, in 1945, just before the end of the war in the Pacific Theater, she marries Howard Chin of Butte, Montana. Howard happens to be stationed at um, an army base, Fort Snelling, as an intelligence decoder during World War II, and meets Margaret at the family restaurant. So that's a, that's a little bit of backstory on Margaret Wu. Um, here's a few other examples of the dresses. So you can see a lot of them have this sort of art deco uh, theme, very, very kind of modern styling from the 1930s. Um, each of these dresses is tailor-made uh, for Margaret Wu. There's no off-the-rack dresses in China in 1936, uh, 1937. Um, some are simple sort of cotton print fabrics. You know, others, um, like what you see here, much more elegant um, in terms of how they're made and the fabric that they're made from. So question, how do we get, right, from these very modern kind of styling, right, for women's dresses in China, 
How do we get there in the 1930s from here, from pre-1912, pre-revolution China? So my job as a historian is certainly to document change, but it's also to explain it. What causes, in just a generation, this remarkable transformation of women's fashion in China? So if we look pre-1912, as Mark explained in his lecture on Monday, <clears throat> the Qing dynasty, the emperor, and the government was always monitoring the activities of overseas Chinese people. And so if you did a lot of trade back and forth to China, if you had family back in China, it behooved you to adhere to Chinese customs when it came to, for men, how you dressed, how you wore your hair with the front of your head shaved and the long cute ponytail in the back, and then for women to also dress in traditional clothing and to either have bound feet as a child or for many Cantonese women, they didn't follow that foot binding tradition, but to restrict their mobility they would wear the so-called horse hoof shoes. Um, and so in order to get around and think about how rough, say, butte streets are, this pair of shoes were from a, a Chinese butte family, to go out on the boardwalk or mud streets, right, of the early 1900s, late 1800s, to balance on that precarious little heel Right? It, it really was about restricting women's uh, mobility and about maintaining control of women. Women were supposed to be in the house. They didn't work. They didn't go outside. They took care of the family. Um, they, they, they did uh, household chores. Right? So how do we get <clears throat> from there to Margaret Wu? in the 1930s. Well, part of it comes with the late 1911, December 1911 revolution led by the, the nationalist and, and Democrat Sun Yat-sen, uh, pictured here on his statue at Sun Yat-sen University, Sun Yat -sen University um, in Guangzhou. However, he as high as Sun Yat-sen's aspirations were for this new democratic republic of China, that new government quickly failed. It failed because of regional warlords, a very weak central government, and the inability of Sun Yat-sen's fellow revolutionaries to cooperate toward a common goal. So China really devolves back into chaos um, after 1912 until 1919, the May 4th movement, May 4th, 1919. And the students lead this rebellion. Um, some of you might recognize those buildings in the background. This is Tiananmen Square. Right, the site of the big student uprising in 1989. There have been a lot of sort of May movements in China. Um, the Tiananmen Square uprising that we're familiar with being only the most recent and the most harshly suppressed of those. However, the students, when they went on the march in 1919, they were really angry. They saw themselves as living in this new democratic republic. And so they hated the idea that despite the revolution, China remained fragmented and weak. One of their main points of opposition, kind of a lightning rod, was the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I and demanded that China give over former German colonies to Japan. This was an insult beyond insults and really set up increasing, right, sort of Japanese control 
of mainland China. The national strike led by the students was soon joined by the working class in China and by the merchant class. It originated largely out of Shanghai, which is kind of interesting because Shanghai was the most westernized city in China. Tremendous western influence, and yet it's there that we get the most nationalist of movements led initially by the students. It comes to be called the New Culture Movement. It's a rejection of traditional Confucian Chinese values. It is also part of it, as you might gather from the women at the forefront here, it's a women's liberation movement. It's a feminist movement. It is anti-Confucian. It is driving for educational reforms, eventually uh, striving also for the reform of technology and industry and for the reform of overseas trade and various kinds of American values like free speech and a free press. So the new culture movement, in some ways, even though it's uniquely Chinese and wants to reject a lot of Western values, it looks very Western, looks very American even, in what it's trying to achieve. And it immediately spawns a whole new genre of literature and film and art, including fashion originating out of Shanghai. Now, just to put a bracket on this story, by 1921, we also have the rise of the Communist Party opposed to the Nationalist Party in China. That leads to an internal split within the Chinese government at the same time that they're trying to fight the invading uh, <coughs> Japanese. And the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, the KMT, is defeated in 1949, nationalists driven offshore to live on the island of Taiwan, and the Communist Party reigns after 1949. So back to our story about the dress. One way we can tell the story of, these dress, of this dress is through some prominent Chinese women. Three famous Chinese sisters, two of them pictured here. Uh, so Sun Yat-sen, um, the man on the left, married to one of the Song sisters, Song Ching Ling. This is their wedding photo from 1915. And then the inheritor, or assumes power really, in a military struggle, Chiang Kai-shek, marries another of the Song sisters, Mei Ling, <coughs> um, wedding photo here in 1927. Now note that they're all dressed in Western clothes, right? And so part of the Chinese Revolution is the embrace of a lot of Western and even American culture, including men and women's dress styles. Now, Although the Song sisters are right, very sort of tight um, as, as sisters, they're very different in their political interest. Um, Sun Yat-sen, during his very uh, kind of struggle of his life, is trying to keep the Chinese Revolution together, something that, that he really fails at, um, whereas Chiang Kai-shek, militarily much more ruthless in establishing a police state and alienating many of the rural Chinese who end up supporting the communists. So the two sisters very, very kind of different in their political alliances. The Song sister not shown here um, is Song A Lin, and she's married to um, China's wealthiest banker and financier. Um, so all the sisters uh, did very well uh, for themselves. So the chapao as a distinctly Chinese style of dress um, comes into its own beginning in the late 1920s and then into the 1930s. And the story hinges around the Shanghai fashion industry. 
So Shanghai is a city marked by Art Deco styles, jazz clubs, skyscrapers, everything that is considered modern and in many ways uh, Western. Um, Shanghai during this period is a flowering of a new kind of Chinese culture and a whole range of new possibilities. New possibilities for men as well as for women. So in terms of visual representation, some of the ways that you'll see the Chapao dress represented is through calendars, paintings, posters, and advertisements for commercial goods. It was the sizzle that sold the steak if you were some kind of a merchant um, in China. And it was idealized in novels and films initially uh, Chinese films, but by the 1940s, American films, Hollywood films um, as well. And it was a social and a political statement that these women were not going to be like their mom's generation, right? They would choose who they would marry, right? It's like Margaret Wu in her diary. I'm not having none of that. Mom is not going to marry me off to an arranged marriage with a village boy. That ain't going to happen, right? She's going to choose uh, her own spouse. So it's a Chinese dress, becomes the national style in the 1930s, and it's a powerful statement for, um, for women, uh, particularly urban and middle class and educated women. Um, in China. So a little bit back to the Song Sisters then. The Chapao dress has some significant variations. Some are sleek, very tight-fitting dresses like these, right, um, with sort of high slits um, up the sides. Others are a little more conservative. So remember, Song Qingling uh, marries uh, Sun Yat Sun, and she represents that sort of more domestic style of Chinese motherhood, certainly embracing revolutionary values, but in some ways in a very conservative mode that is not the kind of drastic break with the 19th century that we see, say, with Margaret Wu. On the other hand, her sister is kind of a fashion plate. So Song Mei Ling, uh, married to the, the new leader of China uh, in the 1920s, Chiang Kai-shek, <coughs> she, she tends to wear the tighter fitted, uh, more stylish dresses and this is important for Americans because she is the feminine face of China. She makes several trips to the United States um, trying to everything from raise money for Chinese orphans that are displaced by the Japanese invasion to direct kind of efforts to raise American support for the Chinese against their war. Um, with Japan. A little bit of a backstory, I won't get into it too much, but it's a little interesting that Mei Ling uh, wears these, these tighter fitting, um, sort of more tailored, stylish kinds of dresses because her husband, Chiang Kai-shek, is trying to, by the early 1930s, essentially outlaw this dress in China. A lot of the nationalists believe, oh, this feminist movement, this women's liberation thing has went entirely too far. We don't want women moving too far away from the hearth and the home, right? Uh, but Song Mei Ling may have embraced that kind of political philosophy in what she said, but in terms of how she dressed, she was very much in solidarity with other young women of Margaret Wu's generation. So th these are often referred to as the two girls' calendars and posters. 
This is just an example of two. There are hundreds of these used um, to, um, to sell all kinds of Chinese products. Everything from cigarettes uh, to hair tonics to, to food and kitchen goods. The Chapao dresses that you see here often embrace very kind of non-traditional floral designs. And remember, floral designs were part of that Art Deco movement um, as well. Um, and although these dresses were tailor-made, they were often made of somewhat cheaper fabrics than what the 1920s dresses were made of. Now, Margaret Wu, she's a Western girl. She had some money to tap into from the wealth that her family had accumulated in Minneapolis. So she tends to buy some pretty elegant fabrics. But some of the Margaret Wu dresses are also simpler, plainer cotton prints um, that you'll see if you come back in January? January, February? Yeah, yeah for, for... We'll say around February 1st. For the exhibit <laughs> um, here. So those government regulations, initially 1929, 1934, by these young Chinese liberated women were just largely ignored. Now, you couldn't get away with that in rural parts of China. Uh, women might be beaten for wearing a dress like this. They might even be cut with knives, right, for wearing a dress like this in the rural areas. But certainly in especially the big eastern cities like Canton or Shanghai, this dress ruled. As the Chinese like to say, heaven is very high and the emperor is very far away. Right? So if you lived in a big eastern Chinese city, the chance that you would be punished for wearing this dress was just about nil. So the Chapal then is really this kind of political statement of, of freedom. A um, couple more ads um, so that you can get some idea of the stylishness of these dress and uh, the sort of, I love the right, really bold colors, kind of art deco uh, geometric designs. Um, and so this is the China that Margaret Wu is entering into when she goes back with her mother and two brothers in 1935. She writes in her diary when they landed in Shanghai, went sightseeing, saw a civic center, administration building with statues of Sun Yat's son in front. He's the national hero. Met the men, that is her, her brothers and, and some other friends, at the Metropole, Shanghai's newest cabaret. Pictured here, photograph from 1935, just after it had been built. Very beautifully decorated, both sides. Inside, with beautiful dance girls, resplendent in Shanghai gowns. Margaret Wu, as an American girl, she doesn't even have a name yet for these dresses. She doesn't say in Cantonese, Chiam San. She doesn't say in Mandarin, Chapao. She said they're Shanghai dresses, because that's where the fashion has originated. And here's the interior the dance floor that she was raving about uh, when she wrote this. Um, it's a gorgeous, uh, big, round, hardwood dance floor. It's suspended on a sprung floor. There's springs um, underneath of it um, so that allegedly you could dance the night away and never get tired to these jazz bands, often black American or European jazz bands um, that were playing. If you look closely at the ceiling, right, you'll see it's decorated with the uh, traditional uh, Chinese dragon. Um, and then in the back, a little harder to see, but those are phoenixes uh, painted on those screens. A little bit like the phoenix um, that is our emblem at the Mewa. <clears throat> so Margaret Wu's Chapao dresses, two shown here. Uh, a few others shown uh, on this slide, they are a big hit. So one of her entries in the diary in March 1936 
went to Marion Lockwood's party. Marion Lockwood is one of the favorite professors at Ling Nun University. Danced at Mrs. Padgett's home. She's another um, instructor, very international school, Ling Nun University. Had to rain, of course. Boys are crazy about my dress. Right? We don't know which dress she wore, but you know, for those of you like me who might just as a stretch of the imagination remember being 20 years old again, that's a pretty impressive dress, right? either of them. <clears throat> so, uh, so Margaret Wu shopped for her own fabrics. Um, as her daughter told me when I interviewed Hane, uh, some years ago, my mom loved a deal and couldn't pass up. So she would spend, I think, a lot more time shopping for fabric than what she spent studying in her classes. She loved Canton, and she would take the ferry over to Hong Kong, loved shopping in Hong Kong. And so she would get deals on these elegant fabrics, bring them to a tailor, and then the tailor would make 24 separate body measurements to fit that dress. Um, as uh, Jan will attest, fitting these to a standard extra small American mannequin is no easy task and requires some significant shaving uh, away. Um, they have the frog or the button and loop um, kind of closures, right, oftentimes Right, very kind of specialized uh, right, necklines, right, with these hand, right, handmade um, embroidered pieces. <clears throat> so the chapao comes to be a marker of feminine independence. For Margaret Wu, it means she has left the village and she's going to choose her own course in life. So in America, we know a little bit about the Chapao during the late 1930s and during World War II because of the Song sister visiting here to raise money. But it's not a very well-known dress in America until the post-war period. And in the 1950s, those Shanghai tailors, most of them had gotten out ahead of the communist takeover in 1949. Um, and most went to uh, Hong Kong, which was, of course, a British colony during that time. Um, so we see the famous American actor Clark Gable here with the most famous Chinese actress of that time, um, Li Li Hua in 1956, um, and they're in Hong Kong. Now, a lot of rumors as these photographs hit the American press about Clark Gable having an affair with Li Li Hua. Um, probably not. Um, when I look at this photo, I sense a certain amount of tension in Li Li Hua with Clark Gable kind of leaning into her and whatever that hand behind it, her back is doing. Right? You know, but Clark Gable, right, is certainly playing this for all it's worth um, to be the big famous ladies' man. Um, so Li Li Hua had moved to Shanghai in the 1930s to become a movie actress. Um, and it's really some of her films that end up getting shown in America that we can start thinking about that style of dress as becoming like a character of its own in uh, Chinese and American film. And film is an international phenomenon after 1945. There, there, we can talk about American films or we can talk about Chinese films or Hong Kong films, but really, uh, even at that early time in the 1950s, film producers, directors, movie houses, distribution companies are aiming for both markets with a lot of movies, right? Um, and so trying to please both of these. Um, we see that really strongly, um, as I'll show um, in this slide, with Richard Mason's book, the World of Susie Wong, 
published in 1957, the novel set in Hong Kong, and then the film adaptation of that bestseller starring William Holden and Nancy Kwan, uh, Kwan pictured here on the cover of Life magazine. So in Western film, unlike in Chinese culture, the Chapao becomes highly sexualized, right? So American audiences during this period, they see a chimp on dress and they think, oh, that woman's a prostitute because Susie Wong, right, was a prostitute, right? So the, the dress gets kind of a bad name and there's some evidence even within the Wu family that Margaret, never mind that she had had kids and couldn't fit into these dresses anymore, but also she, she didn't talk about them with her kids. I think there was some sense maybe of embarrassment. She didn't want to be associated with this kind of American image um, or that this dress had taken on and the way that it reinforced cultural stereotypes of Chinese women. If you read Mark's book, if you were here for Mark's talk on Monday, right, part of his was the way the American government and American culture stereotyped any Chinese women coming to America in the late 19th, early 20th century, oh, they must be prostitutes, right? Which absolutely was not true, right? Margaret Wu's mother, I can assure you, right, was not a prostitute. Her aunt was because her aunt had been taken as a 12-year-old girl from China, sold into prostitution in San Francisco, was saved by a Presbyterian uh, missionary who got her out and married her to um, a Chinese guy in, um, in, in Minneapolis. But she certainly hadn't even been a prostitute by choice. So as the author of, of this presentation, I have some concerns about, about perpetuating this stereotype, right, and, and this sort of male gaze <coughs> that dominated American views of Chinese women throughout most of the, the 20th century. For Chinese women, for women like Margaret Wu, they didn't worry about these ambiguities, right, that we might introduce from a very modern American 21st century perspective. Uh, but for, <clears throat> for them, it's a very kind of yin yang, yin yang, right, a very kind of Taoist approach. And so, sure, maybe prostitutes wear these dresses, but so do schoolgirls, and so do professional women with college degrees or out working right, in, in, in a business or um, uh, as a school teacher, right? Um, and so none of the kind of extreme polarities that were often given over to um, as, <clears throat> as Americans. Um, one film that really beautifully demonstrates some of that ambiguity about the Chapao dress is shown in this scene the Flowers of War. This is a beautiful movie. It's kind of well done um, with uh, the American uh, voiceover, uh, the dubbing. It's uh, by one of China's most famous uh, directors, uh, <coughs> Yang Zhermo. Uh, <coughs> and it, it's about the 1937 rape of Nanjing, or Nanjing, from the perspective of some of the women shown here. The schoolgirls on the left and the prostitutes on the right. It's a very beautiful story, right? So you see, right, the, the, the prostitutes kind of strolling by the schoolgirls and their quilted, unheated schoolrooms in China, right? Um, anyone who's taught in China will attest, right, to how our students sit there wearing winter coats in February. Right? So the schoolgirls in their quilted utilitarian chapal dresses kind of eyeing the prostitutes going by. And the one girl right, that's eyeing the prostitutes even gets a look of disfavor right, from uh, one of her classmates. It's a beautiful film. 
don't want to do too much of a spoiler, but the, um, the Japanese, of course, it's called the rape of Nanjing for a reason. They're taking innocent young schoolgirls like these and locking them up as prostitutes for the Japanese army. So the beautiful story of this film is the prostitutes themselves realize what's going to happen and they sacrifice themselves <coughs> to dress up like the schoolgirls and take their place. Uh, another very nicely kind of balanced view <coughs> of <coughs> the Chapao dress comes from the film In the Mood for Love, also uh, released in, in America. I think it was fairly popular with, um, with, with American audience. Uh, another great uh, Chinese producer, uh, Wang Kar Wai, uh, and it starred uh, Maggie Chung, uh, shown here. And the sort of backstory is that Maggie Chung seems like a perfect mate for a guy that she's in love with, but the bad timing and uh, the spouses that they already have, it doesn't work out. <clears throat> and um, she is a very kind of professional woman. Um, in this, wearing the Chapao dress as a distinctive sort of Chinese dress. And so here, the Chapao dress really is a marker for a professional woman with great integrity, right? Very kind of traditional Chinese values, um, <clears throat> and none of the ways that American audiences might have thought, right, about this dress. So the Chapao today, um, with the kind of historical theory that we, we have at our, our fingertips today, um, we can think about the dress playing a rhetorical role, right? And so we, historically, traditionally, we think about rhetoric as the art of persuasion, right? It's like Aristotle. Right, giving you the rules for a speech. Right? But we know very well in the 21st century that the way we dress is also rhetorical. Right? It's, it's a statement. Right? We make a statement with our clothes. So the dress plays this rhetorical role for young women like Margaret Wu in the 1930s or for actresses in Chinese or American films um, today. Um, sometimes in history we also call this the material turn, where we look at the interaction of people, not just with politics, not just through words, but also in the way that people create meaning with objects, right? Visit the Meiwa Museum, right? Look at some of our display cases, right? Things like um, a traditional Chinese tea set that was given to a young woman from China who married into the Qin family as a wedding gift from her mother, right? And what did that Chinese tea set inscribed with a traditional Chinese poem, right? What does that say as a material artifact about who that young woman was, the adventure she was embarking on in America? Very similarly for, for Margaret Wu, um, and, these, and these dresses. And so material objects, once they're set out into the world, they carry their own agency. They act on us in ways that we might intend or not intend. So for Margaret Wu, the statement that she made at a party in China at Lingnan University was maybe a very different statement than when she was wearing these dresses in the American post-war period, right? Which maybe was an incentive for her to pack those dresses away and to adopt your sort of more standard, you know, rack dress, dressed off the rack from J.C. Penney's. Right? <clears throat> so, um, but but so so I would challenge you all to think about whether it's the way you dress, right? We're Americans, right? So the car we drive. <clears throat> um, 
the hat that we wear, right? What does that say about us? How is that, right, a, a material artifact that also speaks to others? So in, in China today, it's very common to see the chapao dress. Um, if you fly on Air China, their official stewardess dress <coughs> is um, a chapao dress. Um, although I never saw any this colorful. I, the, when I fly Air China, they're always sort of the standard flagship blue. Um, <coughs> but maybe if you sit in first class, you get to see right? <laughs> Fan, fancier dresses. Um, I don't know. But also, if you go into a lot of restaurants, um, you know, other kinds of service industries, um, the women there will be wearing chapao dresses. And so the, in China today, the dress plays this interesting role of speaking to certainly um, women in the workplace, liberated women, but then now it also connects back to this Chinese history of the 1930s, the emergence of Shanghai as an international city that Chinese are really proud of, right? So, so I've had my Chinese students at universities scorn me when they found out I hadn't visited Shanghai. They said, how can you, how, right, how can you ever live in China? And not, right, for them, as young, educated, many of my students, historians, it's more important that you visit Shanghai than that you go to Beijing. Beijing is just where the government is and a lot of air pollution. But you go to Shanghai, you see these beautiful buildings. Even today, the fashion industry, the movie industry, um, it is a, a really elegant city. Um, maybe a little like comparing New York City to Washington, D.C., although I really like D.C. <laughs> um, when I was at uh, Ningxia University in, in northwest China, um, strolling across campus, and I see the, the uh, girls lining up for their graduation photos, and lo and behold, they're not wearing a full-on uh, chapao dress, but they have the nice yoke-styled right, blouses, right, kind of alluding to that tradition. Uh, and so in China today, we see really a strong embrace of <clears throat> that traditional kind of style. And to me, anyway, as, as an American and an American historian, it's a little surprising, right? It would be as if you went to the Montana Tech graduating class photos and you saw our young women graduating from Tech wearing flapper dresses. Ain't gonna happen, right? right? But, but China has this whole kind of different sense of integrating historical culture into the contemporary and the everyday. Um, in, in Shanghai, I never got to see this parade, but there's the Shanghai Chiang San Salon, it's called. And I'm not, not sure how often during the better right, kind of spring, summer months, um, <clears throat> uh, Chinese women get together and they just sort of make a little parade out on the street wearing, right, their, their beautiful, elegant, very colorful, <coughs> right, um, chapao <coughs> uh, dresses. So the conclusion then, to wear the chapao, especially today, is not just to wear a dress, it is to rock that dress. You are performing the dress, right? And as a material semiotic object, given that we've seen it in films, and there's a lot of films with, what's her name, Hathaway, a couple years ago, right, the American actress, she right, made a big splash in a film wearing Chapao. Um, so we as Americans have sort of a particular, both historical but even contemporary view of what these dresses mean and who wears them. Um, and so when we see them in a film, historical film, contemporary film, right, that, that dress carries a message <clears throat> for us. Um, even in China today, um, which I, I think is what my um, <clears throat> Ningxia graduating students were telling me, it's a way of challenging 
traditional Chinese Confucian values, which are still a dominant part of society, but you don't have to say anything, right? You challenge it by what you wear, maybe because you're graduating from a professional program at the university and the kind of job you're going to get, right? Chinese tend to be very, very cautious about what they say regarding criticism of the government or about traditional Chinese values. But they vote with their feet. They vote with what they wear. They vote with the way that they live their lives. So the current popularity, you know, partly it's a fashion statement, partly it's nostalgia, but also it's an embrace of unique Chineseness, right? It's this Chinese value that um, they're very proud of, and I think it plays a little bit to a, a very kind of common feeling that especially uh, younger educated Chinese have. They're a little bit anxious about modernity, and they're a little bit concerned about Americans or the West looking at China as a backward nation, which it most assuredly is not, right? It's politically different than the United States, but it certainly is. If, if, if you had the experience of being tracked on your phone app while you're in China, there ain't nothing backward about that, right? Chinese are very sophisticated technologically, <clears throat> scientifically, and in commerce. But a lot of Chinese still have a lot of anxiety about this. So they want to make this statement that we're non-Western, we're proud of who we are, and we embrace right, our, our culture and history. Uh, there's also a, a contemporary feminist critique about this. And when I, when I talk about this dress in, in a, a, a class I teach in China, some of the young women kind of get into it about this. And so, yeah, it's a very beautiful, kind of very elegant dress, but also it's restrictive in how you can walk, move your legs. Typically it's worn with high heels, right? So the criticism is, oh, this is just modern foot binding. Don't buy into this. Just wear a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, right? right? And be comfortable. Um, so that's the, the Chapao today. So thank you all very much, and uh, be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No questions? Oh, there's one. I'm sorry, I was late. Perhaps you already covered this, but um, I read once that the Changsang going to the left or the right had some significance? Um, I, I've, never, I've never heard that. Um, and I've seen it with both styles. And, and I read um, sort of an official Chinese tailor's description. And in their description, they said the yoke should always be on the left. But, <laughs> right? Person. Right. Margaret Bruce Taylor didn't get that memo. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. It's a it's a great question. And, um, and I believe I saw it in the context of San Francisco prostitution. Oh, okay. You know, that there were ah. that it was an indication if you were a prostitute wow. or not. But wow. I'll try to find that source. And okay. Bring it up for you. Now, now I'm going to have to go right. back through right. Right, right all the photos and look at the dress and then see if there's any variation. Well, yeah. it, you know if. It could always have been a political thing, but I don't it think could, so. Yeah. I think it was a marker for yeah. sexuality. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Other oh, questions? Yeah. How many dresses are still in existence, and how many do you know that she had? Oh, is that Margaret Wu? Yeah. She doesn't write in, in her diary about how many she had made. Um, I, I'm kind of assuming it's the complete set with 27. And I, and I say that because she clearly wasn't just saving the nicest dresses. Mm -hmm. There are some very simple kind of cotton print, even a denim. Right? There's a lightweight denim dress mm -hmm. in the collection. And also, if you look closely at these dresses, they have a lot of wear, right? There are, and look, you can look more clearly. You know, there are perspiration stains. There are little rips and tears. 
Um, there are uh, alterations where you can see where it was sewn up. Um, one of the dresses, uh, the, the frog, uh, the button loop closures were replaced with snaps. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? Yeah. Where are they at now? Um, they're in the museum. Okay. Yep, and, and uh, in, in, in archival storage, uh, which is kind of a shame. We, we, we need to show them. Yeah, please. Great job, Pat. Very, very informative, very well very researched. Cool, yeah. I love the, how you looked at what the nationalists and Chiang Kai-shek thought of the dress and how that changed. Did you come across anything about what Mao and the communists Oh, ab absolutely. And I, I didn't get into that. As of 1949, <clears throat> and it's almost immediate, <clears throat> when, when Mao takes over <clears throat> and the communist regime is in charge, <clears throat> you don't wear these dresses in Mao's China. They are forbidden, right? And Ch China goes to those very kind of unisex worker <clears throat> outfits. So even, right, most politicians, if you're not extremely high ranking, you adhere um, to the new Maoist uh, dress customs. Um, and the idea was we're going to do away with all this decadent, kind of capitalist, democratic, negative Western influence, and we're all going to be equal, which we know Mao wasn't. Yeah. So, so what about now on, in mainland China? Are these dresses more accepted now? They are, uh, yeah, like I showed with the Shanghai, the, the women's parade, yeah, in service jobs, the airlines, um, lot, lots of, it's really fun, uh, as, as Jan will attest, <clears throat> to be part of a Chinese wedding, be invited to a Chinese wedding, because first of all, it's an extravaganza of fashion, right? So the wedding that we went to, um, the bride changed her clothes three, four? Three or four. There was a reception dress, yeah. there was the wedding photo dress, oh, there had also been a red wedding dress, which oh, is yeah. a traditional wedding color. We didn't see that, but that was in some of the photos. Then there was at the end after at the, the end, reception. Another yeah. the traveling traveling yeah. dress. Traveling dress yeah. yeah, but but um, also um, I was traveling in a kind of resort area of southern China um, in Yunnan, and it was a nice spring day, um, and the young women were just lined up all over doing uh, wedding photographs, and a lot of them for one of the dresses they would have a chapala. I, I wonder if there was any, when you were talking about communist China, of course there was the class thing that everyone should look alike, right. but I wonder how much of it was a repression of women's sexuality. Oh, I think it was huge, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and, and men's sexuality, unless you were in the elite, right, <laughs> sex was frowned upon <clears throat> for, I mean, it was almost like um, a traditional English puritanical notion Right, that sex was for procreation, it was a very functional thing, um, and it wasn't about like young people having fun. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely, there was a lot of repression um, about sexuality, and sexuality was seen as by the Maoists as a decadent Western kind of trait. Yeah. Maybe because of these dresses. Do you think? What? Maybe because of these dresses, because the women would wear these dresses that would show their legs and oh, show I think their so. fingers. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and I didn't uh, show it too much, but by the late 1930s, the, the dresses got often above the, the knee, fairly short. Um, although... That makes them easier to walk in. <laughs> although it, it's sort of interesting because for, for Chinese culture, um, and, I, and I think it's true even today, showing legs, women's legs is okay. But showing your neck or your, your back, that's not okay. That's considered traditionally sort of highly sexually charged. Yeah, um, yeah you don't, don't, so the dress so, conforms to that, right? Is that why the high collar? Neckline, right? Um, and I've never seen an open back dress um, in, in this style. Yeah. Are they referred to as the collar? Any other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, that's probably art. Well, thank you all. Yes, we can ask Pat. Um, it's, it's probably. Yeah. Um, I would guess.
wasn't there. Excuse me. Hello. That was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah.